Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for waiting and welcome back. Uh, I do sincerely apologize for all the tech issues that we've had earlier today. Uh, I really hope that uh, most of those issues have now been resolved. Uh, anyways, uh, welcome back. A few important housekeeping issues uh, that you've already heard before. Firstly, this workshop is being recorded. You will have the links to the videos within 24 hours. If you have any QAs, please put your questions in the QA box below. On-demand materials are going to be in this area. Uh, this time, uh, if we experience this, that same, similar kind of uh, issues, tech issues that we've had earlier today, we have a backup platform ready, and uh, we are ready to send you emails just in case something like happens. We have a WebEx backup ready. Uh, hopefully, this time, we are not going to be needing it, but uh, just in case. Lastly, please follow Critical Pass Institute on social media, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. And if you are going to be tweeting or mentioning this uh, this event, uh, please use the hashtag Inc2020. The next session for, for our workshop is uh, uh, treatments administered to the pregnant women for the benefits of the unit. And this is going to be co-chaired by Ralph Bax, Dr. Ralph Bax, who is the chair of Pediatrics at the European Medicines Agency, and Dr. Mark Turner, who is the UK Academic Director for International Consortium. And from here, I'm going to hand it up to Dr. Bax and Dr. Turner. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I hope. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I will keep it now very short. Um, um, just to mention how, how this came about, um, um, it is just fact that the Pediatric Committee at the European Agency and, of course, all of us are increasingly confronted with medicines um, de to be developed for the benefit of neonates and given and administered to um, pregnant women. Um, and, and in our space, um, we are mainly confronted with this issue or, let's say, have the opportunity to deal and discuss um, the planned trials um, in, in the concept of adolescent um, pregnant women being included in trials. This is just how how our um, pediatric legislation happens to work. And obviously, um, we are mainly looking at the outcome, at the benefit for neonates. So it's treatment uh, of neonates. And uh, we thought um, INC and this workshop would be a good opportunity for to show um, where we are in this space, our issues, and perhaps how to and to discuss how we could take this um, forward, um, and therefore I, I was also I must admit also uh, on a very positive note. Uh, it was just marvelous to see how how we could gather immediately a very engaged um, forum and and little group to prepare this session, and with this I now hand over to Mark. Great, thanks, Ralph. Um, I had some slides. Are they? Is it possible to show them? Yeah, I'm advancing them for you. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, without wanting to be controversial, I, I'd say that um, pregnant women remain neglected by the by the research community, and in the past, uh, that neglect has been due to ethical concerns, legal concerns practical concerns and, and commercial concerns. Uh, but I would hazard to say that uh, some of these concerns, most of these concerns have been misplaced and we need to move forward and um, sort of can do this research that's so needed so much. Uh, next slide. Uh, the FDA have summarized this, this very nicely in their, in their most recent guidance document. There are multiple reasons for considering the inclusion of pregnant women, safety, effectiveness of, of the treatment that many pregnant women receive, the need to get the dose right for the woman, and safety efficacy and dose right for the for the for the offspring. And um 
it remains a public health issue that um, is, is important. So it is a public health need that we need to meet. We last had a session in INC about this in 2017, and a couple of the speakers then wrote a, a review to indicate how we could overcome these challenges. And I think the bottom line is that all of the concerns can be addressed, and there remains a clinical humanitarian and ethical necessity to offer research about medicines for pregnant women. This has been recognized in the US, and the NICHD has run a task force on research specific to pregnant women and lactating women, PREGLAC, and uh, this has been a, uh, a work in progress for a couple of years, but the, the group's implementation plan was recently submitted to the, um, the, Dep the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and I suspect we're going to see some movement in the US towards improving the environment and so part of the issue is how can we make that progress general and how can Europe and other parts of the world continue to work in collaboration with our, our, our friends in the US. So this session is aiming to stimulate discussion and then stimulate action by reviewing some contemporary regulatory issues with studies during pregnancy. So um, the topic that people will talk about, as, as, as Ralph suggested, how can we work within the existing regulatory framework? How could we improve the regulating, regulatory framework? Uh, we've heard earlier in this meeting about safety reporting during neonatal studies. So we've got some exciting work about safety reporting during studies that recruit pregnant women. And we're very keen to hear um, the perspective of industry. And this will um, include one or two hints about emerging diseases that are on people's minds at the moment. So um, I'll hand over now to uh, Dina, um, who is going to talk to us from the Pediatric Committee's perspective at the European Medicines Agency. Dina, and I'd ask all our speakers to remember that um, they've got um, five, ten minute slots, and we're hoping to leave lots of time for questions and discussion. Can I mute my yeah. myself? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I will start with part uh, into the problem. Uh, and um, uh, fetus can be exposed to a certain medicinal products either due to maternal illness. Uh, treatment of maternal illness, and uh, this is probably most frequently seen in a clinical practice and uh, best captured by current legislation. Uh, either uh, when we uh, see fetus as a patient and when uh, medicinal products are administered for treatment or prevention uh, with immediate effect in fetus, for example, digoxin use for treatment of uh, neonatal arrhythmias, or with remote effect seen in uh, neonate or child, for example, dexamethasone use for uh, protection of immature lung in newborn. And uh, these studies, when uh, we uh, study fetus as a patient, are quite challenging, and there are several gaps related to current situation with uh, studies in a fetus as a patient. For, first of all, uh, fetal treatments uh, typically are not considered as a pediatric studies, uh, uh, particularly when, uh, uh, unless a uh, patient is a modern, uh, a pregnant woman is not uh, younger than 18 years of old. Uh, there are some ethical issues because there are two individuals involved in these studies. And uh, we should consider maternal side effects as well. Uh, this leads to very complicated endpoints because the ultimate goal of these studies is to reach maximum efficacy for fetus with less harm to mother. Uh, in some studies, we have remote effect for example, vaccination of pregnant women in order to protect the child, so effect is rather distant. Uh, there might be controversial or even unpredictable side effects because not all um, non-clinical models may uh, perfectly address possible risks in humans. Uh, 
uh, long-term outcomes are very important and integral part of uh, safety and efficacy assessment, similarly like it is for neonatal studies. And uh, this is also very important for to establish a favorable, favorable risk-benefit ratio. Uh, for example, to weighting survival data versus uh, quality of life, which is largely described by neurological development of uh, for a neonate. And this is a quite distant uh, effect. Uh, there are some difficulties uh, to detect adverse events in fetuses, for example, pain. And of course, lack of very clear guidelines for studies on drugs intended for fetal interventions. Um, and uh, we should also consider some future challenges. For example, uh, new forms of fetal treatments like drug administration directly to fetal circulation bypassing administration to mother. Uh, this may lead to possible formulation issues. Uh, also, fetal surgeries that, that are developing quite fast and need for fetal anesthesia with all, both safety and efficacy endpoints. Uh, need to, and this brings me to a uh, conclusion that there is a need for multidisciplinary approach involving many stakeholders from all interested parties and of course need for some uh, guidances or milestones that may help probably uh, to better design uh, these uh, very complicated uh, and very important studies. Uh, so I will stop here and I, I would like to disclaim that uh, this is my personal view and I'm not presenting neither uh, EMEA nor PDC, uh, PDCO, so I'm speaking on my own from my personal view, expressing my personal view and thank you for your attention. I will pass the floor for next speaker and David from University College London. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tina, and that fits very well with what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so my group at uh, University College London have been developing a maternal gene therapy for fetal growth restriction over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And uh, we've been considering adverse events uh, because treatment in pregnancy, as you know, can affect the mother. It can also affect the fetus. It can affect, in fact, her grandchildren via effect on the, on the germline. And it can also affect the mother's subsequent children. And uh, we, we also need to consider how the drug is actually delivered, um, the procedure itself, as well as the potential drug, the effect, whether it's a gene therapy, a protein, stem cells, CRISPR-Cas, or whatever we decide we're going to use. We have to consider the effect of the, on the general health of the mother, the fetus, and the neonate, and also specifically on issues related to pregnancy, such as gestational age delivery, fetal growth, and placental dysfunction. And we use adverse events to tell us about the impact that is going to have on the patient or patients, as we have in this scenario. And we use adverse events to tell us the seriousness and to determine causality via our grading system. The difficulty in pregnancy is there is a lack of standard grading criteria for adverse events specific to pregnancy. The CTCAE version 5.0 contains a uh, uh, 837 adverse events, but only four for pregnancy, including fetal death, preterm birth, and fetal growth problems. The Division of AIDS uh, lists adverse events with severity grading, for example, vaginal bleeding, obstetric infection, and the WHO can classify severity of preterm birth according to gestational age. And the surgeons have a classification, the clavian dindo classification of surgical complications. Uh, but we don't have anything, as a, speaking as a fetal medicine specialist developing fetal therapy, we don't have anything which, which can really ensure the safety for our trial participants. We need to have some adverse event definitions and grading to allow us to guide decisions in phase one trials, for example, dose escalation, stopping criteria, comparing adverse events in trial participants to those in untreated women, and comparing safety between trials of different therapies. Specifically with adverse events in pregnancy, events can have a very different impact on the pregnant woman and the fetus. Um, so adverse event grading needs to consider that. Um, for example, chorionitis might have a mild effect on the, on the mother, but actually lead to fetal uh, uh, death, uh, grade five. Uh, 
Also, there is a low threshold for admitting pregnant women for observation, and it may be difficult to assess the impact on the fetus. The current tools that we have are really limited to cardiotocography, imaging, and fetal movement assessment, which is very subjective. And so, as part of developing a clinical trial protocol, we decided we had to tackle this head on. And so, we developed an adverse event severity grading for clinical trials of maternal and fetal therapies. We first of all reviewed the literature about uh, grading and definitions. We're using relevant national and international guidelines and societies. Uh, we then convened a steering committee uh, in May 2015, uh, consisting of industry experts, fetal medicine, fetal surgeon, paediatric surgeon, neonatologists, and we came up with a draft set of 12 maternal and 19 fetal adverse event definitions and severity criteria. And we approached the MEDRA, the Medical Dictionary of Regulator Activities, and discussed with them, and they adopted 17 new fetal terms to their MEDRA version 19.0 in March 2016. And then we also wanted to include patients in our, in our consensus. And so uh, we convened a patient public engagement group with seven UK charity representatives and came up with good practice recommendations for trials of novel therapies in pregnancy. Things that we might not necessarily think about, for example, parents recommended that we should record antenatal decisions to terminate the pregnancy or to have only palliative neonatal care after birth. We should assess the psychological impact of the intervention on the pregnant woman and potentially assess uh, indications of fetal pain or stress and record data on subsequent fertility in pregnancies over a time period relevant to the intervention. We then took our adverse event definitions and grading and subjected them to two rounds of Delphi consensus with international experts, industry, uh, neonatology, paediatric surgeons, fecal medicine, obstetricians from across the world, as you can see illustrated here. And we did this for both our fetal adverse events and our maternal adverse events. And we achieved more than 70% consensus for all 31 definitions and almost consensus for the maternity and fetal severity criteria. We then convened a final steering committee and came up with our final adverse event uh, grading system. We grade it independently for the pregnant woman and the fetus. Pregnancy conditions, as I've said, can affect the mother and the fetus separately. And fetal adverse events were defined as being diagnosable in utero with potential to cause detriment to the fetus. This is our final list. At the very top, you can see four maternal adverse events and fetal adverse events that are shared across both individuals. Um, you can see that uh, we have, for example, fetal adverse events uh, affecting fetal heart rate, bradycardia, tachyarrhythmia, and affecting different uh, organ systems. For instance, the fetal brain, the fetal gut, et cetera. And so in conclusion, we've developed new adverse event definitions that have been adopted by MEDRA. These new severity grading criteria can be used to achieve systematic and consistent adverse event grading in clinical trials in pregnancy. And we hope they will provide meaningful understanding of safety and allow trials to be compared. I'm really looking forward to hearing some feedback on this because obviously this is our version 1.0 and we would like to disseminate them further. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank everybody who's helped uh, fund this, and I'm going to hand over to Rosalind Hollingsworth and Tamala Mallet moore Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to join from Sanofi today to talk a little bit about the experience that we've had with um, uh, influenza vaccines specifically and then more generally uh, vaccines for the prevention of um, influenza in mother, fetus and in newborns. So a vaccination in pregnancy is a well-established intervention to offer protection from often serious consequences of infectious disease across the range. Um, so we, we've seen uh, over many years uh, vaccines being offered in pregnancy. Um, for uh, a number of infectious diseases such as smallpox, pertussis, influenza, tetanus. Um, and these come along with not only, uh, in some cases, regulatory allowances for use of these vaccines in pregnancy, but also strong recommendations in place uh, from agencies such as the WHO, PAHO, and uh, the US CDC and others. 
So the vaccines that are administered currently in pregnancy can help to protect the pregnant woman herself, the developing fetus and the newborn. But as we move forward to develop uh, vaccines for the prevention of other infectious disease, it may be that um, we may be considering protection uh, for one or more of these um, groups as being more important uh, than the other. So the challenges of to vaccination or to research in pregnancy have been numerous, um, and much of this has been driven by the experience in the 1960s with drugs like uh, thalidomide. Um, from a vaccine perspective, our other uh, challenge is that there's been a lack of clear language in vaccine labeling to describe the safety, immunogenicity, and efficacy of vaccines in pregnancy. So for example, there's often not a specific indication for use in pregnancy, although there are equally no contraindications to use in pregnancy, and pregnant women may be included in an age-based indication, uh, such as we have for influenza vaccines, which are indicated for use in those from six months of age. Um, there's also no clear recommendation for passive protection following va uh, vaccination of a pregnant woman. Um, so it's not been established traditionally as an indication uh, that there would be protection for the newborn or that uh, vaccination of the pregnant woman would offer protection of the, of the newborn. So in terms of influenza vaccines more specifically and how we've been considering uh, streamlining and improving the labeling language for influenza vaccines. Um, they are currently labeled for use at any stage of pregnancy. Um, we have language in there as well, in the labels as well, that indicates that um, data from worldwide use of inactivated influenza vaccines don't in indicate any adverse events. However, the language on the opposing side has never been that positive to say actually what you can expect are some very positive outcomes for uh, for the babies and the, the newborns. Um, so we had um, did some completed some work recently with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, including more than five thousand pregnancies and five thousand live births, uh, where studies have been conducted with one of our influenza uh, vaccines um, to evaluate the impact not only on prevention of influenza but also um, on outcomes that might generally be considered um, an adverse event in, in many contexts, but the positive side of vaccination means that um, they, they could help prevent some of these adverse um, outcomes. So the studies were carried out in Nepal, Mali, and South Africa. And just to give you a brief overview of the outcome, um, the efficacy of the vaccine for influenza prevention uh, was around somewhere between 50 and 70 percent for the mothers. But we were also able to establish that in terms of newborn protection, um, somewhere around 35 to 40 percent efficacy for the prevention of laboratory confirmed influenza. But as noted, this is really just one uh, um, area of interest for us. It was we were also interested in understanding uh, could this help um, babies to be born at a, a normal birth weight and um, prevent preterm births and so on. And so those outcomes were also measured. But in terms of the risk of influenza in these very young babies, there is no other opportunity to offer prevention because vaccines aren't recommended for direct use in this group um, under six months of age. So whilst the efficacy effect may be modest um, at best, it's actually the only thing that, that we can do. So our next question was, could we add the data from these studies that have been completed to our label to improve clarity of labeling um, for this use? Um, and indeed, we're working with the regulatory agencies in Europe. Um, we have been able to modify our labeling language um, to include a specific recommendation for pregnant women on the basis of these data and to make it clear that the use of these vaccines in pregnancy can offer some protection um, to those from to newborns from birth to less than six months of age uh, following uh, vaccination of these pregnant women. Um, and it's with that that I'm going to hand over to Tamla. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Good morning, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? 
I can hear you, Tamla. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very good. <laughs> so um, it is my pleasure to be here. I am a U.S. trained board certified family physician. Um, and part of my practice, I um, had um, the great pleasure to be able to care for um, pregnant women and deliver their newborns. Um, and so it's been also a very great pleasure um, coming into industry and working in pharmacovigilance to be able to continue um, my passion in vaccines, um, especially when we um, are concerned about talking about pregnant women um, and um, neonatal health and uh, what things we uh, can do to ensure that our mothers are having very good pregnancies um, and our newborns have a, a very good neonatal um, period. And uh, so just to piggyback on some of the things that um, uh, Rosalind has already shared with you, you know, the last 10 years, I would say, have been tremendous in terms of um, enrolling uh, pregnant women into clinical trials and following them um, until um, the birth of the newborn and seeing some pretty significant outcomes with the newborns in terms of reduction um, in um, preterm births and in, increase in, in, in um, um, newborn weights. Um, and so, and, and also in having that opportunity to work with the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation, we've been able to do some things with um, quite a few of our labels. So, um, as she mentioned, there there are the positive gains that we've had in Europe uh, with um, our influenza vaccines and labeling. Um, and we also recently have had some positive gains in the U.S. Um, in terms of labeling and indication for um, our tetanus vaccines. Um, but how are we getting there? And so we have um, the opportunity to to engage, of course, in your traditional um, randomized clinical trials. Um, we have some opportunities to look for additional indications, um, but there are also some newer opportunities that have often been overlooked and, and we're starting to um, exercise them more and that's with real world evidence and real world data. Um, there is even guidance from the FDA on how to use this real world data and literature um, in the clinical trials. Um, there are also opportunities to look at databases, to look at retrospective information. And so um, some of the more popular databases, uh, some of the places where we're really finding good real world evidence, of course, is um, the public database, the thin uh, database in UK, um, the US Medicaid uh, or Medicare database, and maybe some private databases like a Kaiser Permanente or some other health system. Can I get the next slide? Um, and then, you know, there are, um, <clears throat> I would say, you know, it's a, a little bit more different to have a straightforward clinical path uh, trial for, new, for neonates, but it is possible for, for infants. And in vaccines, in fact, we, we do um, have quite a few uh, clinical trials um, um, in the infant population. Can I get the next slide, please? Um, and then there are some newer opportunities that uh, we have exercised, I would say, just in the last two years in terms of our partnership with our RSV vaccine, uh, with uh, Metamune and AstraZeneca. You know, it's a second generation vaccine after Synergist. It's called um, Medi8897. Um, and with this vaccine, we had the opportunity um, at phase three to go to the FDA and to go to um, the EMA um, and ask for additional scientific advice. Um, and um, as um, good preparation will have it, uh, because of the safety and efficacy that was shown in the first um, 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 phase one and two trials, we, we got additional advice uh, throughout via the prime initiative from the EMA and um, and via the breakthrough um, designation from the FDA. Um, and that um, allowed us to fast track our clinical trials um, for um, our infants um, for RSV. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, <laughs> I think I just really talked through all of that. We're very uh, proud to, of course, um, um, have the breakthrough 
um, designation and the prime designation. And so I'm just going to um, wrap up now. Can we go to the next slide? Um, and just in conclusion, you know, vaccination is a well-established intervention to offer protection um, from often serious consequences of infectious disease. Um, vaccines administered to, to women uh, in pregnancy can help to protect not only the, the pregnant mother, but also the fetus and the newborn. Um, randomized clinical uh, trial data has been successfully used to update labeling uh, for the benefit of uh, women and newborns in pregnancy um, for influenza and pertussis. Um, and new pathways are being gained, uh, established to gain maternal and natal, natal and infant indications using real world evidence and real world data. Um, just in terms of how this will be applied to the COVID-19 vaccine, Rosalind and I both have the pleasure of um, serving as leaders on the COVID-19 vaccine trials uh, that we have uh, at uh, Sanofi Pasteur. Um, and so we will be um, developing some protocols that will um, include pregnant women. Um, and so look for more to come um, on those developments. Thank you very much. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to hand over to Fernanda. I understand that we're maybe missing one speaker at the moment. Well, I, I suppose the slide uh, I was going to present is on. Um, hello, I would like to continue with uh, RSV maternal immunization as one of the medications uh, or vaccines administered to pregnant women for the benefit of the neonate. Uh, there are five key aspects I, I would like to uh, uh, discuss uh, today. The first is the regulatory approach to the benefits. Uh, this is driven by the indication. Uh, for example, the language prevention of RSV disease in infants through vaccination of pregnant women does not imply any benefit to the mothers, uh, but in fact, the benefits may occur to the mother as well. Uh, we know that RSV infection in pregnant women uh, is typically associated with asymptomatic um, or mild disease, but reports of severe disease cases and adverse outcomes exist uh, as well. For example, respiratory distress, preterm labor, and hospitalization. It is also possible that maternal immunization prolongs postpartum immunity um, in the mother, therefore reducing um, uh, potential infection of the mother and possible transmission uh, for the baby. The second aspect uh, that is also key is the clinical development pathway. Uh, we know that the clinical development of vaccines for maternal imm immunization is complex. It's very far from being straightforward. The approaches uh, to the de development of pediatric RSV vaccines um, are more diverse, uh, also complex, but uh, are more standard than those for maternal immunization. Uh, I can cite here operational aspects of maternal immunization studies, such as trial design, safety surveillance, and clinical parameters to be collected. Uh, those have been only very recently be, uh, developed to guide um, clinical investigators and to allow us speaking the same language, at least in terms of key terms for the assessment of the safety of the vaccine in pregnancy and the harmonization um, of the adverse events definitions uh, done by Gaia Consortium and Brighton Collaboration. Uh, the third aspect is uh, the optimal timing for maternal immunization. And here we, we, we need to take into account two things. First, uh, the timing during pregnancy. So the timing of vaccination during pregnancy will need to balance the potential for the disease prevention in the mother with the need or, or the goal to maximize transplacental antibody transfer. So the clinical trials typically are targeting second and third trimester. So the 30, uh, 24 to 36 uh, weeks of 
gestation. The other aspect is the RSV seasonality. Uh, this is an important consideration when discussing maternal immunization due to the variable exposure of infants in the first year and also the protection that is offered by maternal RSV antibody titers uh, due to the periodic natural infection, which is uh, in temperate regions concentrated in a predictable annual three to five uh, month season, while in tropical regions we know that the RSV season is less predictable and more prolonged, uh, potentially necessitating region or country specific immunization studies. Uh, fourth, the safety consideration obviously is, a, is a, an important challenge, uh, uh, mainly because, as uh, you know, background risk inherent to pregnancy challenge uh, heavily the assessment of safety. Um, the, the, the second part is the inclusion exclusion criteria that should be balanced uh, between minimizing risk to participants and also enable uh, inclusion of relevant populations uh, that have um, high risk. Uh, obviously, this is done uh, depending on the phase of development, uh, but uh, we, we need to also consider to include a population that mirrors the general population that uh, uh, eventually at the, at the end will uh, get uh, the vaccine on the market. And uh, also consideration for the knowledge gaps that we still have in terms of disease bur burden, contribution of transplacental and breast milk antibodies, the duration of protection and the effect of maternal antibodies on infant immune response uh, to vaccines or in infection. Uh, last but not least is uh, with all these challenges, um, we need to articulate the benefit risk uh, in mother and the child, uh, because safety and efficacy needs to be demonstrated separately in two subjects, the mother and the child. And this may require, uh, for example, extended timelines, um, several months after uh, vaccination and also several months after the birth of the... Can you hear and see me? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Thank you. Great. So in, in thinking about clinical trials in pregnant women for the benefit of the neonate, I think we need to build upon some considerations from clinical trials, both in pregnancy and in pediatrics. And Anna touched upon these a little bit, um, but I'll go into a little more detail. So, okay. Including pregnant women in a clinical trial um, requires careful benefit risk assessment how do we identify this trial population that will drive the most benefit while also minimizing risk? We really need to think about considerations for, and benefits and risks to both the mother and the fetus. And then the question is, I think, how do we measure these benefits and risks? So when thinking about how to assess the benefits and risk of including a pregnant women in a clinical trial, there's a number of factors we need to consider. Um, the first one is, is the drug approved for a condition already? Um, is there adequate reproductive and developmental toxicology data from relevant non-clinical models? And then in the investigational space, um, is there really a direct benefit? And in the post-marketing space, I think we also need to consider whether there's an established safety database or consider We need to consider, as Anna mentioned earlier, um, how does gestational timing of exposure align with fetal development? Um, is, this is both relevant, I think, for safety outcomes as well as thinking about transfer rates and absorption. We need to think about what the type of product it is and whether there's any class effects and how does this compare to other therapies. We'll also need to consider the severity of the underlying condition, which may play a role and what are the inherent risks to the pregnancy? Um, another important factor is, can we identify an appropriate control or comparison group? And then how well will this pre-market clinical evidence extrapolate to real-world use of the product? 
in the post-marketing setting and whether we'll have risk management tools that could be necessary or available to manage specific risks that are identified. So thinking about some considerations from the pediatric population about risks and benefit, um, a couple things we need to think about specific to pediatrics. We really need data on neonatal outcomes, um, gestational age, birth weight, and other critical covariates that might be relevant. And I think Anna touched on that earlier. Um, information should be considered about the incidence and prevalence of the disease, the pathophysiology, the method of diagnosis, and currently available treatment. I and mean, in thinking about medications for neonates, um, as I mentioned in the last slide, I think maternal absorption and dose to fetal benefit is important. Developmental variability should be considered when we look at the inclusion criteria, endpoint assessment, sample size calculations, um, and analyses. And this is really dependent on the stage of pregnancy and the fetal development. So for these studies, it may be necessary to develop and validate um, different assessment that tools that have been used previously in different endpoints for specific time points of pregnancy. Um, I think was, as was discussed earlier, long-term evaluation is likely to be required. And then we have to think about um, the availability of this population. How will we find them? I mean, is there, are there research networks or registries we can use? And then informed consent is also likely to look different um, because it's likely that we need both parents to consent so in summary, um, key issues to address when thinking about benefit risks, um, there needs to be harmonization of standard definitions for key safety outcomes, which I think is what Anna was talking about um, after maternal treatment. We really need to consider the inherent risks associated with pregnancy and have a clear understanding of these risks in the specific populations. We need to fully understand the impact um, of the burden of mortality morbidity and mortality, which is associated with the pediatric disease. And we'll also need baseline rates of outcomes to demonstrate the efficacy and benefit of the treatment in infants. Um, there will also be ethical and regulatory considerations that we need to consider. And um, finally, which was discussed this morning, I think that we need to think about whether there's supplemental information that can be obtained from other study designs, such as observational studies. So I think we're actually- Thank you, thank you, Keely. Yeah. No, actually I think Dom, Dominic just came on the phone and uh, I will advance his slides. Dominic, can you hear me? Can you please speak up so you will know that uh, we can hear you also? Hello, every, uh, hello to everybody. <clears throat> Hi, Dominic, uh, glad to have you on the phone. Uh, I have your slides. So please uh, go ahead and, and speak up. Just let me know when you want to go to the next slide and I'll advance your slides for you, okay? So thank you very much. Uh, we still discuss treating mother to protect newborns. Uh, the following, uh, next slide, the following presentation represents my personal opinions. I have no interest to disclose. Next slide, please. Let's consider prevention of RSV. For decades, uh, RHV prevention has been restricted to very high risk groups, antibodies with challenging administration for only very high risk neonates to prevent heavy neonatal or pediatric intensive care unit burden and death. Uh, paradigm is shifting towards generalized prevention suitable for all neonates and infants in the first year of life with single shots to prevent medically attended visits. And we see that ongoing development of maternal vaccines uh, follow such pattern. This is a very good progress, uh, and I'm fine, we are fine with this. Nevertheless, still several patients are hospitalized in the PQ with invasive ventilation with pulmonary sequelae and or neonates veiling. Our collective responsibility is to go on addressing the needs of these high-risk groups. Let's focus now on the maternal RSV vaccine uh, and consider a difference in evaluating priorities for outcome. Prevention of RSV through uh, 
RSV medically attended acute respiratory illness uh, is nice. This will increase the comfort of life for newborn, for their families, and for their pediatrician also. Nevertheless, very severe lower respiratory tract infection remains a crucial target as it is responsible for a huge number of hospitals and PQ admissions, invasive ventilation cases, and deaths. Yes. The case of RSV prevention highlights the, the need for input of expertise in pediatric and neonatal drug development. Uh, another uh, point, uh, difference to, to consider is uh, in evaluating methods. During the winter season, in temperate climates like EU or and US, hospital remains crowded for several months every year and bronchiolitis epidemics lead to the interruption of scheduled activities. However, despite its importance, hospitalization is not recognized as a major outcome due to differences in healthcare systems, meaning uh, availability, availability of beds, and differences in medical standard of care in the centers. The pediatric team could call for stratification on centers uh, that would provide sufficient robustness to this major outcome and, when not feasible, possibility of using randomization by blocks to prevent unbalanced distribution <coughs> within the centers. What is the, state, the statement now? The EU pediatric regulation... Uh, next slide, please. The EU pediatric regulation is only triggered to agree... Uh, pediatric investigational plan for pregnant adolescents below 18 years of age, not for adult pregnant women. This corresponds to missed opportunity regarding potential benefit and reducing potential risk to neonates. However, the pediatric drug development expertise is needed here to recognize and consider the population of most interest meaning at major risk, uh, to optimize the choice of endpoints in neonates, uh, like very severe LRTI, intensive ventilation, etc., and to support the use of hospitalization as endpoint, including measures to make it more robust. Next slide, please. What are the horizons to consider? We are really honored as panelists to represent the views as pediatricians contributing to the regulatory field as dialogue and collaboration between patients, families, experts, manufacturers, and regulators is essential to address the problem. Systematic pediatric input is needed in any case to optimize the outcome parameters and to minimize any potential risk for neonates. To conclude, there is truly a regulatory loophole needing to be closed, uh, and this corresponds to a potential matter for future evolution of the... Well, thank, thank you, you uh, Dominique. Um, we, we've already heard from yes, Fernando, um, so that, that was good. Should we move to the question and answer session now? Uh, because yep. we've heard from all the speakers. So I think everyone's appearing by magic on your screen, with the possible exception of Dominique, who... Um, has been battling for two hours to make the connection. So thank you very much, Dominique. And um, it worked even with all those difficulties that you faced. So, so thank you to everybody for, for working so hard. So um, let's start with some questions. And um, I think the first question has come from, from Dr. Baer at the FDA, um, asking Dominique, um, uh, totally agreeing with the importance of reducing severe RSV low respiratory tract infection. What Jerry and the FDA here is that the number of events make the randomized controlled trials too large and onerous. Do any of the panelists have a comment about primary pediatric endpoints for maternal RSV vaccination? I'm sorry, I did not understand the, the question. The com the the. The quality of the phone is not so good. Mm. Okay, I'm very sorry. I'll try again. 
Do you have a suggestion for primary paediatric endpoints for maternal RSV vaccination? So I can say I, from my... Um, I, I, I hope... So Dominic, I, I, go ahead. I, think, I have the feeling that we, we have the duty to consider uh, the very severe LRTI, uh, even it's very diffi difficult to, to define the very severe LRTI, and I think we have the duty to address the, 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 the situation of the most severe uh, infants and neonates. So I would be glad to have a, a very severe LRTI put on, uh, not on the on secondary endpoints, but on primary endpoints. Great. Thank you. Tamala? I, I think it's a little bit, it, it's very difficult for me to talk about uh, endpoints in the neonate or the infant from maternal vaccination. And that is because um, at Pasteur, we are not conducting any um, um, maternal immunizations in this space. Everything that we're looking at is in um, the, new, the neonate or the infant. I know that we continue to have that, that it's very difficult still with the F subunit of the RSV uh, vaccine to really um, provide efficacy. So uh, in, in terms of efficacy following maternal immunization. So I, I think it's a little bit difficult and I don't know um, for GSK, Fernanda, are you guys doing, are you doing maternal immunizations or are you, are, are you conducting infant immunizations? Both. Yeah, yeah. So, Fernanda is the right person to speak to this. <laughs> <laughs> But the answer was there, I, I think. Yeah. So, Fernanda, what was your answer? So, Fernanda, no, what I was your uh, point? No, I think uh, uh, they already answered <laughs> the question. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so, moving on, a um, question from Dr. Davis. Uh, may, what Mark, is it? Mark, may, may I just add that, that there are. Yeah. Every every year we have more than uh, from 10,000 to 100,000 uh, uh, kids dying from RSV. The burden is is very huge, and I'm not sure that we can uh, shift all the problem to uh, to to reduce only the 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 medically attended visit in uh, in in high income countries. True, um, this is not the true uh, outcome for the for the humanity. I think uh, another point is uh, I think we could discuss this. Uh, you, you know, maternal immunization. The the most important message is that uh, maternal immunization is discussed only with. Uh, adult doctors and adult regulators and i think this uh, we miss opportunity to discuss and to be on the same table to discuss this because we need pediatrician we need neonatologists we need regulators dedicated and uh, to, to infants and we need uh, companies dedicated to infants to do the best job this was my message thank you so much Thank you. So, so moving on, um, I think we can take a question from Dr. Ariano. Uh, how is the effectiveness and duration of immunity to vaccines affected by pregnancy compared to non-pregnant women? I, I can start with a response to that one, if you like. Um, I don't think we have any data to suggest that um, 
there's any difference in duration of protection for a pregnant versus a non-pregnant woman. Certainly in terms of the immune response to vaccination itself, it seems to be broadly comparable. Um, I think that one of the important aspects of this, though, is a point that was raised about when is the right time to vaccinate a pregnant woman in terms who, of you know the anticipated date of the birth of their child. Um, and also recognizing that balance that we were discussing between benefits for the mother, the fetus, and the newborn. So for something like flu, a woman is at high risk of influenza and poor outcome of influenza right the way through her pregnancy with an increase in risk as she moves later in pregnancy. So you're giving the vaccine as much to help protect her as you are the potential benefit for the newborn. Whereas something like pertussis or RSV even, you're giving that vaccine predominantly for the protection of the newborn. Um, so the, the balance shifts in terms of when you might be thinking about um, the timing of vaccination by what you're trying to achieve and also um, considering other aspects like seasonality and, and things like this that also adds complexity to this notion of maternal immunization for infant protection. Thank you very much. There was a question from Dr. Davis about the impact of vaccination trials on prematurity, but I think we've had, had an answer to that question just there as well. So fantastic, two answers. For, for the price of one. So, so thank you very much. Um, please add in further questions uh, to the to the boxes. The um, maybe while we're talking about vaccinations, we can move on to something something really um, interesting and topical at the moment. And um, I'd be interested in the panel's comments on maternal pregnant woman immunisation relating to the SARS CoV two virus. Uh, what do people are there plans? Good idea, bad idea. What might get in the way, regulatory issues, so on. What, what do people think about that? So one of the things I struggled with putting in this presentation was um, really some research that um, was done um, at Brigham and Women's uh, University, um, and the publication came out this summer. And uh, it, it uh, actually uh, went back in time and looked at uh, women who were enrolled in the Zika trials and it asked a number of ethical questions. It, it gave four different scenarios and asked, you know, if this was a live vaccine, you know, would you want to take it? If it was, um, um, you know, it, it basically gave you different questions. If it's this type of vaccine versus another type of vaccine, would you like to take the vaccine? And um, it also talked about consent. And what that publication really showed was that women are willing to take vaccines in pregnancy if physicians and um, are upfront with them about what the risks are uh, for the vaccine versus the risk of not being vaccinated, as well as what protection it would offer for the baby. So that, that's a different topic, it's, it's not COVID, but that gives us an understanding that women are willing to participate in COVID-19 trials. Um, so on the other hand, we know um, that we have some responsibility to do um, a lot of those uh, trials in pregnant women. Um, there are lots of consortiums ongoing um, to look at the risk management plans, uh, not only for pregnant women in the post-marketing world, um, but also for all populations. Um, so pediatric populations, elderly populations, uh, patients that may have comorbidities like diabetes, et cetera. And so there is um, lots of activity around that. Uh, many of us uh, sitting right here on this panel are participating in um, SPEAK and uh, VAC for EU and uh, other organizations that are actively looking at um, how we're going to study um, the additional populations um, during the post-marketing phase. And so I, I kind of invite some of my colleagues who I know are working in those spaces to chime in and, and just talk about um, it from their perspective. Maybe uh, Fernanda or, or Roz has a little bit more to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, 
Well, this is Fernanda. Uh, the pregnant women are priority target population for vaccination for COVID, and, and there are plans, um, there are several vaccines uh, in development. And, and um, what the companies in general are doing are incorporating the pregnant women in uh, the design of the phase three studies. The, the, this is not done uh, in general, but uh, in um, uh, majority of the companies are considering including this uh, population in the phase three, okay? And, and this is before the vaccine is put on, on the market. Uh, some other uh, companies are also considering to do some uh, studies after uh, uh, when the vaccine is on the market, but uh, yes, it, that is the, uh, the situation now. The, this was done also for uh, the previous pandemic uh, H1N1, um, but at the time, uh, because the, the uh, maternal immunization area was not so well known, and, and, and there were some concerns at the time. Uh, this population was vaccinated uh, in, in uh, the post-marketing setting in, uh, in uh, as uh, high-risk uh, groups. But now that we know more and uh, we have m more data with other vaccines, uh, this is uh, the case that we are incorporating this population in phase three. Yeah. Thank you. So could I could I always also ask to uh, add just a small comment? Um, I think from the early days of the, starting the vaccine development programs for prevention of COVID nineteen disease, uh, regulatory agencies and others have been clear that certainly the WHO, for example, issued a target product profile um, and asked that at the very least we thought about um, not, not having a contraindication to use in pregnancy in our labels. So what data would we have to collect to ensure that at least there was no contraindication to use in pregnancy? Um, and then, as, as stated, I think there is generally interest in uh, conducting studies or incorporating into phase three if we can. I think that one of the interesting features of the vaccine development programs for COVID-19 will be um, uh, there's a real mix of traditional vaccine technology and much newer technology. So in terms of pregnancy use uh, and development for pregnancy, we might find that some of the more traditional technologies, perhaps with experience already of use in pregnant women might be favored for the early uh, studies or early use in, in pregnancy compared to some of the newer technologies where we may be looking for more extended safety follow-up and so on. But I think that uh, remains to be seen seeing that with a lot of things for, for COVID-19 currently. And it also, for me, brings me back to the question of who are we, where is our primary interest in vaccination? Is it with the prevention of COVID-19 disease in the pregnant woman? Or is it in the newborn? Um, or is it some combination of both? Um, and some of that will come back to the pediatric studies that we may want to conduct as well. And where does that balance? point lie between uh, the need to protect the newborn versus having a vaccine available for direct protection of that population. And you know, what we really are seeing also is, is that um, there are quite a few um, studies ongoing um, in the US and in Europe. Uh, we have some uh, very early studies that are being published from pregnant women. Um, that are um, going to either the hospital as high-risk um, pregnancies or um, um, as high-risk deliveries. Now, um, some of the challenge that we have is that some of the women, as they get better, they are lost to follow-up. Um, so where we really have uh, real outcomes is for women who uh, go into the hospital positive for COVID-19 and stay there until um, they deliver. And um, the Vaccine uh, Safety uh, Data Network um, has been really good about uh, publishing uh, in the MMRW um, on a pretty regular basis. But, you know, I, I would say some of the more significant publications have just been um, August, September, October. Uh, so we're very early on at being able to look at the U.S. data 
uh, from about 13 uh, data centers with vaccine safety uh, data link, uh, where we could see um, and follow um, some of the COVID positive uh, pregnancies uh, un until delivery. So it's very early, but we do we we are keeping an eye on it um, as closely as the as the CDC will allow us with their publications. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think perhaps we move on now, and I'd like to ask um, people who are able to hear Anna's presentation um, about their impressions of that approach to uh, looking at adverse events in pregnancy. Uh, maybe a comment from Dina and um, one or two other industry people, because uh, people may not have heard about the work that INC has done in the past, but we did a fairly similar exercise, almost inspired by Anna's work in, in, near, in the neonatal group. So we have a neonatal adverse event severity score, um, which is also linked in with some of the databases and then Anna's, Anna's work. So I wonder if anybody could comment on that. Okay, uh, I, I have a brief comment on that because uh, these uh, adverse events have been uh, discussed uh, discussed quite extensively in our working group, and uh, there are uh, two groups of adverse events that must be considered. One a group is a direct adverse event to fetus. And uh, there are adverse events that might be quite uh, sufficiently captured, like heart rate or, or uh, um, uh, fetal development. And there are uh, quite a wide range of adverse events that cannot be sufficiently captured in fetus, like pain, because it's very complicated to address pain in, in, in very small children, and it's almost impossible to address pain in fetus. And uh, also impact on, on, on things like surfactant development. And uh, other group of adverse events are, is adverse events in uh, neonates. And again, uh, these uh, all comprises two adverse events directly in neonates and long-term adverse events that are always challenging to assess that they, uh, that, uh, because these long-term require time, require and mainly we are focusing on environmental adverse uh, events that are uh, that can be assessed only at two years of age and uh, it seems that this is not always um, very easy to set uh, the goal and uh, this is uh, the, the uh, these are milestones for uh, assessing positive risk benefit ratio because we have had a lot of discussions because what is the primary endpoint survival or quality of life and we have a very good example uh, for um, uh, in, uh, about using of um, hydrocortisone in pregnant women uh, with the same purpose to protect uh, lungs in uh, preterm neonate. And uh, this study revealed that there are some adverse uh, new developmental outcomes. And this is why uh, these uh, fetal studies also should uh, consider quite prolonged time until uh, at least basic new developmental outcomes are uh, possible to be assessed. So this is uh, my comment that this indeed is very challenging. Thank you very much. Tamala, then Anna. Oh, no, I don't have a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought, I thought I saw your hand. So, Anna. Yeah, thank you very much. I think um, we had a similar issue about uh, considering the sort of benefit of, of what do the mums want. And we actually asked them specifically, um, you know, if you, we asked a set of mums who had actually experienced uh, severe fetal growth restriction and many of them had had a stillbirth. And we asked them, what would you, would you take part in a trial? And would you even take part in a trial where potentially your baby might die? And they felt very much that they wanted to uh, take part in a trial where they were given the option of at least having a live birth. They, they feel their fetus, they don't talk about their fetus as a fetus, they talk about them as their baby. So I think it's really important that we do ask women as we go along. And I was interested in the discussion about COVID-19. Um, 
women do want to take part in COVID-19 vaccine trials. We've certainly been asking them. And I, I think we need to uh, really address this and ask them, well, what, what, would, what risk would you be prepared to take? Sometimes it's quite a high risk that they'd be prepared to take if it was going to uh, allow them to have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy neonate. So, so thank you very much. So Anna's got this fantastic uh, event score scoring system that's been based upon parental perspectives. So I hope everyone can find ways to to use it and um, and apply it and, and validate it even further. Um, moving on, um, I think we've got a message um, from from Dr. Klein uh, from the from Health Canada. Um, she says it seems to me that a real world data, real world evidence database would be a good way to look at some of these issues. So how could studies in pregnancy benefit from real-world evidence? Uh, any any comments from industry on that? I could take that one. Um, I mean, I think that we do use real-world evidence a lot um, to look at pregnancy. I mean, most of our post-marketing studies are in observational data. So I think that it is it is definitely used and i think okay great uh, i was going to say it's challenging sometimes because i think we don't have the information that we might need and so sometimes you have to do a prospective data collection versus retrospective but i think you know combining different data sources um, of real world data really gives you a more complete picture thank you anna Yes, I think that that is absolutely true. I think we we uh, we have to really focus on the disease that we might be treating. And one of the difficulties is when we are looking at pregnancy specific diseases like women at risk of preterm birth or women uh, at risk of having fetal growth restriction is we have the real world data from when the baby delivers or when the woman goes into labor and we fail to have really good data before that actually happens. So, so in our hands, what we've had to do is do a very carefully phenotyped, very detailed study of women who are diagnosed with fetal growth restriction before they actually deliver the baby and then develop some tools to predict who is going to be the population that we actually want to test out our drugs in. Um, and we can, uh, with very careful phenotyping using uh, blood samples, using Doppler data, we can pick out women who have uh, a baby with an at least 50% perinatal loss rate. And when we've approached women and said, would you want to take part in a trial uh, of a new therapy, then they're the women in whom there is this risk-benefit ratio. But it's very difficult. We need lots of this real-world data uh, to be able to uh, appropriately pick women for trials of new drugs, for trials of therapeutics, because if we get it wrong, it could have quite detrimental, devastating effects on, on the mum and the neonate. Great, thank you. I guess part of the answer is that um, there are so much efforts to demedicalize pregnancy that we don't have the women in the same setting that we have the neonates. Neonates, every breath is recorded, whereas almost all pregnant women don't um, have to spend so much time near healthcare professionals. So I think maybe a slight divergence, divergence between pregnancy and, and neonates. Now, there's a really interesting question from, from Dr. Ariano. Um, are there any vaccines in development to address, for example, group B strep, CMV, or herpes? So maybe someone can give us a quick, quick walk through uh, that landscape. Um, from my Pamela? perspective, from my perspective, yes, yes, and yes. Uh, CMV is not on my team. Group B strep is very, very, very early, um, and HSV is uh, in phase one. So. Um, more to come on that story, but that, that's about as much as I can say right now. Thank you very much. We look forward to all of that. Those are devastating conditions. Thank you, Ron. Um, so now there's a question from, from Dr. Nakamura from Japan. So thank you very much, Hide, for staying with us at this at this time. Um, and Hide asks, will there be a new INC working group focusing on this topic? He feels it's an extremely important global topic and so I'd be grateful for people's thoughts about what, um, what, what a working group could consider. Anna? 
Well, I'd certainly be very keen on working uh, with INC to try to disseminate what we've done so far. We see what we've done very much as a first step. Um, it's taken a long time, but I would be delighted to work with, with INC and, and, uh, and other people to try to disseminate, to adopt, to really get clear thinking about how we address it, because we... I, I feel having joined the group, there's a lot going on for neonatology. You have this pediatric investigational plan. What about a maternity investigational plan? I mean, that potentially is something that I've been calling out for, uh, really, <laughs> in the applications that we've done uh, with the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in the UK uh, for about eight years ago. I think we absolutely have to address it. It's, it's, it's really critically important for our pregnant women. Uh, that we address this. So I'd be delighted to work with people on that. Thank you very much. Tamala Keeley? Well, I'm, I'm, delighted to, I'm delighted to work with the group as well. Um, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting, um, the call to hear for um, the maternal uh, investigation uh, group. I, I think it's a great idea. I think, I think in the last decade, we have made tremendous strides in um, refocusing our efforts on pregnant women, but I, I think it's different for vaccines than it has been um, for other therapies. Um, so I think we're we're in a good place to be able to to move ahead with something like that. But I, I see um, that uh, vaccines kind of would be the leader there, and and then other drugs may be able to follow. Great, thank you very much. Any final thoughts from industry partners about what a INC working group on pregnancy trials could, could consider? I'd, I'd like to consider as well some of the regulatory aspects that were raised around um, the, these gaps in legislation that were mentioned and, and also reflecting the geographical differences in attitudes towards um, trials in pregnancy. And, you know, I, I mentioned in my presentation that we've been very successful in Europe in pushing forward with labelling change to reflect the benefits of flu vaccine, for example, for all impacted by that maternal immunization. Um, but the FDA has had a very different response to um, that kind of approach. And so I think that uh, globalization or lack of globalization piece is going to be important too. I, I think we have a very similar success with our tetanus vaccine and labeling in the US. It's very comparable to what we have done with um, um, the EMA and flu vaccine. I think it's, it's just so brand new that we, we haven't recognized it yet, yet. But I see both agencies going in the same direction. Um, and, and happy to be a leader on, you know, trying to find that, that way to get this uh, information into the labels. But definitely, you know, the FDA does have a guidance out there. Um, it's a little bit of a older guidance from 1998, and I don't think a lot of people are really using it. Um, but um, we, we see a way forward. So we're asking the, the FDA and the EMA and the Health Canada to keep working with us. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think lots of good thoughts there. Um, may, uh, anybody else, or should we, we need to close? Well, I was going okay. to, to say that we, um, this is Fernanda. Um, I, I, I think we need to continue on building on the knowledge of this area because uh, there are still uh, um, things that we need to learn, specifically on the transplacental antibody transfer. There, there, there is still uh, areas where, where we, we need to, uh, to have uh, some answers. Duration of protection, for example, the interference of the antibodies uh, uh, crossing uh, uh, to the to the baby or immuno interference with uh, vaccines uh, uh, that are administered in, in uh, the child. So they, there is still uh, uh, some investigations uh, ongoing and, and many things to learn in this area. Great, thank, thank you very much. So we've come to the end of our time and I'd like to thank all of the um, of the contributors, all the speakers, all the panellists.
for such insights and such energy that, that can take us forward. And um, I've been asked to point out to you that there's a, a survey and there's um, what's going on. So, Okay, so while people are doing that, I'm going to go through the my closing remarks. I was hoping that these would be um, on the screen, but that's not possible. So I'm going to have to act out um, the uh, the closing remarks. The we heard from each of the working groups that um, for me there was a culture of excellence and achievement. The communications team are working hard to translate our work into the um, the, the the real world. Uh, the safety team are working hard to validate the study that's been done for neonates, and we have the opportunity to do the same for, for pregnant women. The data terminology group was focusing on interoperability, and the hemodynamic adaptation group was working hard on analysis. And each of these different aspects of, of excellence will help us in the future. Then um, the trial design and trial execution group gave us all some top tips for conducting clinical trials um, based around early engagement and trust building communication. So there's lots more to share and learn from this from this work. Then we had the racial and health equity session, which uh, I found quite heartbreaking, both the stories of individuals and, and the, the history lessons. So um, we need to put babies and families at the heart of what we do all babies and all families. And that means recognizing the structural racism that we work within, including the unconscious bias that we all have and the conscious bias that we sometimes see. We heard about the need to develop a culture of equity, to identify and mitigate social risks, to support families in a way that meets their needs before and after discharge, and develop equity-focused quality improvement. And so those actions, I think, are balanced between healthcare professionals and um, other stakeholders could contribute by making the research work relevant, which means listening to relevant people as research is designed, um, building trust by going to the right people, bringing them into the system by hiring and getting the right um, media advice, and investing in the communities, and um, building credibility without being coercive and making sure that everything we do is, is targeted in an appropriate way by listening to people. Then in the real world data session, I think the key words there were lake and warehouse and vision and learn confirm wheel, focusing on trans transformation. And we will make a difference uh, by following the successes that CPATH has had in the past. And we've just heard about the the pregnant women and the need to get regulatory harmonization and to characterize ways of assessing adverse events in neonates. So the next steps could be um, continuing, continuing the effective working groups and developing some new ones. In the past, we've been focused on the babies and have had separate groups around lungs, circulation, safety and engagement and many other topics. But now I think we need to tie all those groups together with a golden thread of data that can be used for multiple purposes. And I think this is the, the beginning of a new stage for um, INC as we move from talking and making suggestions into working with data that will lead to these actionable insights that, 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 that will be so informative. So thank you very much to all our speakers. Thank you very much to the technical team who've put up with a, a lot of difficulties beyond their control. And um, hand over to Ralph for, for his concluding remarks on behalf of the agency. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Now you can hear me. We can now. hear you now. We can yeah. hear you now. You yeah. know, it's, it's this, I still haven't learned uh, tackling this double mute. Uh, so, and in any case, um, Mark, uh, Mark actually has said everything I wanted to say, but uh, I would like to 
point out um, some some basics, and 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 I would like to first of all like to thank all of us, all presenters, panelists, and all participants uh, who took the time to prepare, to present, and to participate actively, overcoming any technical hurdle as I just managed myself just about. For sure, you will agree um, that these days were really very intense, um, and, and they covered, as Mark has pointed out, a, a really wide array uh, of, of topics showing also the depths of, of INC and actually showing also the depths of neonatology. Because what came to my mind when we spoke about uh, other um, CPAS initiatives and consortia. I mean, it is really neonatology is, of course, and we have to remind ourselves it's it's it remains unique, uh, covering actually all of these therapeutic areas, and 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 that shows a little bit, as Mark just said, uh, where we have to combine and 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 find a common thread. Um, of course, I, I I was also very much touched by by. The, uh, by the reminder we we got to um, to think about ethnic and socioeconomic uh, diversities and to in integrate it into our work um, and finally I will not repeat now all uh, all discussion items and topics and and we have heard proposals to create further working groups and I'm sure um, these will be considered by INC leadership and CPAS but now I would specifically like to thank the whole team with uh, Laura, Zara, Roxon and Convalid for running this workshop. Um, they are, as you know, all just marvelous. They never give up encouraging us to contribute, including sending regular reminders, perhaps it's only to me, but okay, I then thank you very much personally, <laughs> and organizing everything so smoothly. And then of course, my thanks also go to the whole INC leadership team and CPAS. Indeed, it's amazing how much we can do, uh, can do nowadays, nowadays directly online and avoiding unnecessary travel, honestly. But despite all these technical capabilities, I'm still really looking forward to meeting and discussing with you personally in the future again. I just wanted to remind you that presentations, videos, and all these materials which have been uh, collected, including the whole video recording of this meeting, will be sent out in a couple of days. And as everything was so packed, I, I we realized that there are there might be still some questions left, or you might have the really burning questions coming up now and and they can still be answered just send them to CPAS and and they will forward them to to the speakers so thanking all of you again so for now goodbye thanks again for making all this happen happen and working in this space stay safe and take care from wherever you have joined us today thanks a lot